Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Well, it's lovely to see you all here tonight on such a lovely day as well. Um, and um, it's my, I'm Judith Diamond, for some of you that might not know, um, and I'm on the committee that uh, put these programs together. Um, and it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Jonathan Arnold tonight. Um, this is for the third time of trying. When he first moved to Canterbury, we heard a big rumour um, very early on that um, he might be just the ticket for this, me this, this uh, our group um, and that we would be interested in hearing him speak and maybe even sing. Um, but um, uh, a certain pandemic got in the way in 2020 and in 2021 and uh, third time lucky and uh, we're, we're all here so we're very very grateful and welcome you here and those that are watching online um, and so um, obviously most of you seem to know Reverend Jonathan Arnold already but for those that um, don't um, he was educated at Hereford Cathedral School and went on to Oxford then studied at the Royal Academy of Music before becoming a, a vicar choral at St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, we're talking about a man of many parts. Um, he's a, um, been a soloist with many renowned ensembles, but also, um, when, I wrote, when I wrote this, I said he had been a regular member of the 16, but he tells me um, this evening that he has returned to the 16, so he is an active singer in the 16, which is lovely to hear. Um, and he has also, um, he, he took part in a marvellous TV series that um, was on some years ago that was narrated by Simon Russell Beale, some of you may remember, on sacred music. And so if he looks familiar, that might be where you saw him. Um, he trained for the ministry at Cudston and was ordained in 2003. But he's also a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and has written about pre-Reformation humanists, um, and he's written two books about sacred music. Um, the first, Sacred Music in a Secular Age, um, and now Music and Faith, Conversations in a Post-Secular Age, which was published in 2019. And he's also been involved in fascinating research projects about the experience of music and contributed to very, very many journals on very many aspects of music and theology. But he also now has a day job, um, and he's leading the diocesan community and partnership team, dealing with local engagement with our community and issues of social justice, including the refugee system, this situation. Um, so there's a whole other talk that he could give us another time, but not tonight, because tonight we're really looking forward to hearing you speak on the theme of sacred music in a secular world, a theological perspective. So can we please welcome Jonathan Arnold. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. It's wonderful to be here with you after all the delays and, and setbacks of COVID and it's lovely to see so many uh, familiar faces here today. Um, can I just start with a plug? For those of you who um, haven't seen it advertised yet, there's a concert happening at the Cathedral on Friday, this coming Friday, the 17th of June. And this, um, this takes up part of my singing world and part of my social justice world because it's a concert for Refugee Week. And um, for Refugee Week, we've invited the world-famous uh, vocal ensemble Steely Antico to come and do a recital with um, the Ethiopian refugee poet and playwright broadcaster Lem Sisse. And they'll be at the cathedral this uh, Friday at 7.30 with the Syrian-born oud player uh, Rihab Azar. And if you've never heard an oud before, um, I can highly recommend it to you. It's a bit like a, a lute or a guitar. It's got a rounded back and it's a very, very beautiful sound, and she will be explaining the oud and also playing some solo pieces on that. Uh, so please do come, come to that if you can. 
When Palestrina wrote his mass settings and motets, or J.S. Bach, his cantatas and passions, they could not have imagined the ways in which their music would be heard today. We can now access our sacred music in our living rooms, at work, on the commute, an hour-long compilation of the choir of New College Oxford performing the Arnius Day has four and a half million views on YouTube and five different versions of Bach's Matthew Passion have over a million each. Spotify and smartphones eliminate the need to visit a church or a chapel or to hear these works in concert, but we still do. While overall church attendance has fallen since the 1960s by two thirds, attendance at traditional choral worship in cathedrals, for instance, is on the rise and has been for the past two and a half decades. Even songs at uh, Magdalen College Oxford and other college chapels uh, are resolutely popular as well. And the trend is not confined to university or cathedral towns, um, but it's largely due to their weekday choral services in Britain's 42 cathedrals that have seen this remarkable rise in popularity. So at the end of the 20th century, uh, cathedral services were falling by 5% each year. Figures are now up by a third in a decade, and that's excluding tourism. Now, even song attendance in Britain's six most popular cathedrals rose by 34% since 2008. And that's pre-COVID, but we are returning to post-pre-COVID levels now. And all of this in the face of a marked fall in biblical literacy in Britain through generations. And according to the research that's been uh, put out by the Bible Society, 30% of secondary school children did not choose the nativity when asked which stories they thought were in the Bible. Among 15-year-olds, the figure rises to more than a third, 35%. And the number of 15-year-olds that indicated that they had not read or seen or heard the nativity is around one in three. By contrast, over a third thought that storylines featured in The Hunger Games and Harry Potter were or might be from the Bible. More than one in four, 27%, thought that the storyline of Superman would or could be part of the Bible. And 46% thought the same thing for Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. And parents themselves find it hard to distinguish the plot lines of well-known biblical stories from the latest Hollywood blockbusters. Asked to decide whether a series of plot lines appeared in the Bible, almost half of parents failed to recognize the plot of Noah's Ark as a Bible story. And around a third were unsure or did not recognize the stories of David and Goliath. Adam and Eve, a quarter failed to recognize the parable of the Good Samaritan. And all of this, and yet we have this, the most performed and most popular classical piece in British concert halls now and has been for many, many years is Handel's Messiah. It's an extraordinary statistic. Evensong has barely changed since the publication of the prayer book, and it's perhaps not a coincidence that attendance at traditional choral services started to surge just as modern life began to seem most removed from the world of candles and canons and communal reflection. Choral services offer an antidote to the modern age of instant di digital gratification. As the working day ends, chapel and cathedral goers can enter a beautiful space where they can be still and silent and receptive and accept the drama as it unfolds. As the choir and clergy process in, the scene is set with their flowing robes and worshippers can scrutinize their faces 
see their folders of music and hear the blend of their distinct voices as they begin the preaches and responses. For many Christians, there exists a kind of unwritten contract between the priest and the readers and the musicians and the listeners and the unseen divine. The music enhances the words of the service, giving beauty and character to the heartfelt words of the Psalms, the joyful thanksgiving in Mary's song of praise and liberation and justice, to Simeon's grateful prayer for rest in the Nunc Dimittis, and the prayers of the collects. The music of worship is interspersed with silence in which our own thoughts and petitions creep in and become part of the tapestry of the liturgy. But you only need to glance at the statistics to know that not all of those who attend these services are Christian. The cultural, ethnic and religious diversity of those who attend Evensong is remarkable. Formal choral worship does not coerce the attendee into any particular doctrinal confession. Even Richard Dawkins admits to having a certain love for choral evensong. People are free to choose the extent to which they engage with the worship, which is in many respects more passive than in Sunday services. At evensong, the focus is on listening and the worshipers do not take communion. For a generation who struggled to sit in silence for a few minutes without taking out their phones, quiet reflection is hard to come by. But peace and reflection are important, especially at a time when one in eight people suffer from anxiety disorders. And so too is community, especially after COVID. The under 35s who trace their friends every move on Facebook and WhatsApp are nonetheless more likely than those over 55 to experience regular feelings of loneliness. And we heard figures come out this week about university students being lonely. Attending a choral service offers a, an oasis in the working day, not just because it's escapist from the noise of the street or from work, but because it's participating in something other than ourselves. It takes the noise of our mental business and quietens us towards an inner silence. It points towards the transcendent and forges a bond between all in the sacred space by the shared experience of the liturgical rite. A thirst for the sacred and spiritual remains a keen one. And according to Brian Mountford, it is the commitment of institutional Christianity to search for truth through beauty that has kept so many non-believers involved. While well, for theologians such as Hans Kung and Karl Barth, the experience of transcendence can only be explained through the language of faith, Mountford argues that it can be accessed through religious art and architecture and music and within the Christian liturgy, sound alone can enhance the height and the depth and the sadness and the joy and the fear and the loss and the triumph of our experience. So what can come into Christian ears as sound and what we perceive as beautiful as Christians can also be perceived by secular ones. This is clear from the responses that I received uh, from a research project that I did back in Oxford called Experience of Music. And listeners almost always described choral music as profoundly moving. One recalled a sense of being transported, quote, out of the realm of everyday living, it was otherworldly and beautifully done. And sacred music not only attracts secular listeners to, secular spe to sacred spaces, but it also takes the sacred into secular ones. Because, since the 18th century, sacred music has been liberated 
from the confines of our cathedrals and our churches and our chapels. And it has been culturally assimilated into innumerable secular contexts, both public and private. As the historian Tim Blanning has observed, it's one of the great ironies of history that Bach's religious music should be so much more available and so much more esteemed in a secular age than at any other time. An important step in the elevation of music and its creators was to divorce them from service to a third party. In the case of Opera Theria, that party was the prince, the wealthy patron, and in the case of religious music, it was God. Although Handel appears to have been every bit as devout as J.S. Bach, his staging of oratorios in theatres for the paying public pointed the way to music's eventual emancipation from its function. Now, I was going to play you a clip of the Salve Regina, but you all have the Salve there. And as it says on some of these sheets, this is plain chant which goes back one and a half thousand years to the beginnings of Western uh, music. And I thought we could have a little sing. What do you feel? Some of you have got modern notation and some of you have got the old neumes which they still sing at Westminster Cathedral, where I sometimes go and sing, where I'll be singing on Sunday, uh, which is the Catholic Cathedral in Westminster. And they still use the, uh, the breviary and uh, missal and graduale there. So let's have a go. If you don't know it, just follow the dots and listen to your neighbour, OK? <laughs> Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve. A Te Clamamus, Exules Filiae, A Te Suspiramus, Gementes et flentes in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ego, advocata nostra, illos tuos misericordes oculos ad nos reminds me of going on retreat to Alton Abbey where I used to go and um, where I've been for 20 years and it's the last thing they sing at night after Compline before they put their hoods up and sort of drift off into the night for the greater silence and then no one's allowed to talk until after breakfast which I always think is an excellent policy. <laughs> So music, this music, this music, the Salve Regina, would never have been heard in a secular context when it was written, not for many, many hundreds of years later. We can sing it here tonight, and you'll hear it sung in concerts and in other places, but that would have been unheard of. 
But as Frank Burke Brown has noted, we do not perform or listen to Bach today as in the 18th century because of cultural and musical and liturgical shifts. The taste required for making and hearing music is culturally shaped and likewise evolves in relation to how we live, our living traditions. Other sacred music from the Baroque 18th century is heard in the concert hall, Handel's Messiah, as we've heard. And the rise of the sacred oratorio in concert halls has moved music from the church to the concert and has to be reimagined. In Bolman's study of post-enlightenment reconfigurations of public and private spaces, he declared that with the new stage in modernity unleashed by the religious enlightenments at the end of the 18th century, worship and music of worship moved from the sanctuary to the public square, sometimes in gradual stages, but often through the dramatic modulation of public soundscapes. Sacred music, Bullman argues, like Blanning, had to re-enter the modern history of public religion, not as function, but as music. Not just as something sacred and secret, but music per se, music sound. For an example, Bolman cites the Turkish March from the final, final movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which he says bears witness to the pre-enlightenment encounter between Christian Central Europe and the Muslim Ottoman Empire. And in Herbert von Karajan's textless reworking of the Beethoven Schiller Ode Joy, the European anthem, the Turkish march is silent and the symbolic center of the European Union is purged of that Turkish and Islamic history. That's what happened. Bolman cites other examples of private religion becoming public politics, such as Eurovision songs with implicit Muslim identification and the banning of minarets and the call to prayer. In addition to these religious, political, and ideological public musical expressions of the sacred, there is the more physical dimension of music's inherent existence within time and space and musical notation. The musicologist Nicholas Cook has argued that music transforms space by giving it social meaning. Music retains its meaning even when reduced to a recording. Music also connotes place extremely well, but can easily be extracted from its space and appropriated elsewhere. So I associate the Salve Regina with Alton Abbey, but here we are singing it in a Methodist chapel. So for instance, on the macro level, Poland identifies itself with Chopin, who came from Poland, and Vienna with Mozart. And with the result that if you hear a piece of Chopin or Mozart in an underground station in South Korea, as you do, the cultural link with Poland or Austria might remain for a European listener, but the music has been appropriated to the extent that for the native South Korean, it carries no connotations of European culture or cultural prestige, but rather it embodies an apparently effortless or naturalized international modernism. So Western tonal classical music can be appropriated anywhere. And on the micro level, portable design, uh, digital devices um, that we put our music on, um, our phones or, or whatever, mean that we can create even on loud public transport, with noise-canceling uh, headphones, a personal, private space. And it's pleasant to do so sometimes. Such devices reshape space and create a phenomenological space that is disassociated from physical space. 
Adorno's early work regarding audio recordings was remarkably prescient in this respect concerning the ability of the microspace, somebody listening with headphones, to convey transcendent, numinous, even divine truth. In this, what he calls traffic with technology, formulations capture the sound of creation the first and the last sounds, judgment upon life and message about which that, whatever that might, what about which may come up thereafter, after life. And with regard to sacred music, its meaningfulness can be translated into a secular space without any loss of power. But equally, sacred music can be appropriated to new cultural contexts and used in ways unforeseen by the composer. As we've said, Bach and Handel would have been astonished uh, by the ways that their music were heard today, let alone the monks who first sang the Salve Regina. Here's an example, uh, Talis's Spem in Allium. I will later on this year be fortunate enough to sing Spem in Allium at a late night prom at the Albert Hall with the 16, which I'm delighted about. It's been one of the most popular pieces in the sacred repertoire for years, and it's been recorded by every major uh, early music group. Uh, but one group that have recorded it are the Talis Scholars. And Peter Phillips, who directs the Talis Scholars, wrote that I am thrilled that Speminalium has attracted such a new, large audience. It is one of the most remarkable achievements of the human mind an extraordinary and moving piece written for 40 individual singers. For me, it ranks alongside the best works of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and confirms Talis as England's greatest composer. It's on my iPod. So do we have 40 people here? Because I've got the copies. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not, not tonight. Okay. Let's see if we can hear a bit then, shall we? It just takes a while to... Um, this one to start for some reason. A very reluctant soprano at the beginning. Sorry, I've got to stop it. There's no easy way of stopping it. I must just say, by the way, that um, this evening's lecture is, is all about Western classical sacred choral music. Um, since this piece of research, I've done a whole new uh, piece of research on popular music. <laughs> so I can come back and do that another time. But it's, it's not going to be tonight, unfortunately. Okay, so. so Reference to personal digital interaction with the music suggests a chain of connections with the music within sacred, sacred and secular spaces. We listen to this piece privately on our headphones. It conjures up perhaps a certain memory of a live concert performance we've heard from the Talis scholars or whoever, uh, which may recall to us in turn a, a liturgical performance, which in turn reminds us of Talis's 16th century Christian England and the wealth of sacred music written for the liturgy, and the connections between modern secular space and the original sacred context are resonant. It's like an echo. 
But what Peter Phillips would not have predicted in, in his, uh, when he said all that about Speminalium is that this particular recording was, went on to be used in the film Fifty Shades of Grey as the soundtrack to an erotic drama. And I wonder how many people watching that film would have been thinking about the Elizabethan Chapel Royal or their need to put their hope in the God of Israel. The sacredness of the music can be translated into new contexts, but it can also be appropriated to a new cultural context. And in so doing, does the theological essence of the sacred music become entirely lost? Daniel Chua thinks not, and he's asserted that secular society, ironically, has tried to get rid of God, but puts God center stage. Theology persists in secular thought for two reasons. First, intrinsic to the historical development of modernity is the progressive marginalization of God as the source of explanation. On the one hand, this allows humanity to take center stage as the autonomous agent that shapes God's world, that shapes the world. Yet on the other hand, in defining itself against God, the modern world finds its identity bound to him, albeit as a negative image or anti-theology. Second, despite its rebellion, modernity ends up replacing the old theological structures as its new modes of thought. Its grand narratives are often the rehearsal of biblical ones. Creation, fall, redemption, apocalypse, all revised without God, of course, Music acting as a kind of divine surrogate is elected to exemplify both the possibility and the ultimate futility of these human projects. Thus, music can be heard as a mode of secular theology that exposes some of the major theological issues of our times. And James Herbert suggests that one of the reasons why we cannot separate the sacred from the secular in our society is due to a historical saturation of religious culture within the arts. The sacred is simply part of our artistic heritage language. Religious issues arise even in seemingly secular works of art or music or sculpture or whatever, where we might not expect them, because Christian mysticism and metaphysics thoroughly permeate the rhetoric and sensibility of Western cultural production. Herbert here is echoing the words of the Italian scholar Chiamo Vatimo in this respect, who said, while our civilization no longer explicitly professes itself Christian, but rather considers itself by and large de-Christianized, post-Christian, lay, so it seems to gnaw at the wound of modernity as much as it desires the spear that might close the wounds and of secular theology that would, though it would like to transfigure the past, may, to varying degrees, question or simply remain open to an unknown outcome. At least the language we profess, prof, possess to refer to God persists in a society that is now arguably post-secular, a term that might need a little explanation. Post-secular has emerged in the complexity of religious decline, but an increase of those seeking spiritual nourishment. If secularization is the process of reducing religious and spiritual belief in society, then post-secularism is a time when the forces of secularization have not only stopped, but where the social forces have driven a renewed appreciation for the place of spirituality in general society. A post-secular society has become one in which holistic spirituality is flourishing despite Sunday church attendance decline. And this holistic experience contains a number of factors. Ian Mobsby has argued that the return to the importance of the subjective and the experiential over the rational 
and a return to the appreciation of the sacred and enchantment of life is a worldview informed by postmodern sensibilities. And this phenomenon has seen a huge increase in the number of people calling themselves spiritual but not religious, SNRs. Spiritual, not religious. Nancy calls them extra-theistic, that is, people who have either never been to church or have stopped attending church, but they still seek transcendence and na in nature and beauty and seek to make sense of, of unity and connection and seek meaning to guide life's journey and seek mystical truth that lies within. Philip Blonde, in his work Post-Secular Philosophy, suggests that secular minds are only now beginning to perceive that all is not as it should be. That what was promised to new atheism, self-liberation and the limitation of the world of human faculties, might after all be a form of self-mutilation. So a post-secular age is one where we're realize, realizing that we need relationship and belonging more than ever. As Mobsby again writes, our post-reformation, post-enlightenment inheritance is the cult of the individual. And in short, we desire community, but we often have no idea where to find it. And as a result, culture has become less humane the church has not escaped the scourge of rampant individualism either. Some churches operate like depersonalized corporate communities, emphasizing the business of conversion. And others operate like imperialistic establishments. And both forms of individualism gravely impoverish the quality of our spiritual communities. So now, what do we mean by spiritual communities. So, to use Crow's term, soul-making, and working with Sarah Morgan's doctoral material on community choirs, they define spirituality in psychosocial terms of communal experiences that nourish the mind, body, emotion, and spirit. And so the spirit not only works upon the individual, but arguably even more so when a community is gathered together. And following the secularization of the arts in the 20th century, there has become, Boyce Tillman argues, a marginalization of the sacred and a deep sense of loss. Morgan and Boyce Tillman see the rise of the community choir as a deeply connected with the fulfillment of a truly nourished humanity in which deep human needs are met by singing. Basically, the research says that the loss of our parish church choirs have migrated, those singers have migrated to the village community choir or the rock choir or the pop choir or whatever it is. There's no shortage of choirs. There's no shortage of people singing. So what they can't get anymore in the old model is translated into, into the new. And that's where body, mind, emotion, and spirit are being nourished. Spirituality is not just a creation of and for individuals. It's shaped by larger social circumstances and by the beliefs and values of wide culture. And in the post-secular West, spirituality is seen by some as increasingly diverse, relating to the experience of connectedness and relationship, or oneness with a higher power, or with nature, and the appreciation of personal growth and inner awareness of one's life journey. So whatever our definition of spiritual and spirituality, art, whether it be music or poetry or painting or sculpture or any other art form, takes us beyond 
ordinary concepts, propositions, and analyses. If it did not, then there would be no need for the art form in the first place. And it's precisely because that art can take us beyond the constraints of theological prose to the ineffable that it's so necessary. And this is where Karl Barth comes in. Because he says it's exactly because of its lack of concepts that music is the true and legitimate bearer of the message of Christmas, the adequate expression for the highest and final dialectical level, a level attainable by singing, by playing on the flute, by playing on the piano. Or, if you prefer Giles Fraser, musicians make the best theologians. I have more to say about composers, but as often happens, I run out of time. And I just want to move forwards to John Taverner. And John Taverner um, moved away from institutional Christianity to a universalist position. He started off Roman Catholic and then he became Orthodox and considers himself and what his role is as a composer. The fact that I've been given this universalist vision of the world makes it a possibility that I might be able to contribute just fractionally towards the healing of a planet that's torn to pieces at the moment by strife, by war, by different religions warring with each other. But through the universalist language of music, perhaps there is a possibility to bring about a healing process. And after all, music originally was dysfunction. If one listens or looks at the rituals of the American, Indian, or African tribes, one sees that all ritual ceremonies and all music was either addressed to the Creator or it was music of healing in order to help heal. Music in the West has become so sophisticated, so totally sophisticated, that I think we've lost sight of this dimension in music. I can't really say any more than that, except that I think, obviously, any kind of music that is dealing with higher realities, in the end, must go towards a sort of sacred nothingness. So therefore, possibly one day, I shall just stop. To put and I thought that was quite interesting that in the end, John Taverner started by writing extremely difficult and complex music. I don't know if you know his opera, The Whale, or anything like that. It's very avant-garde. And ended up writing very simple music, which leads him into a, a kind of eternal silence. And some of the um, notes in his music were extremely long, and he called them eternity notes. Uh, sort of long-held drones that were supposed to symbolize the theological, um, uh, so the symbolism of, of, of eternity. And I just wanted to say a little bit um, about explicit and implicit religion. If we think of explicit religion as the propositional, the rational, the logocentric, and so on, the creeds, the our scriptures, and so on. Um, it, it lives alongside an implicit religion, and some scholars have argued that we need both if we are going to have a full um, spiritual uh, experience. So philosophers tend to concentrate on religious beliefs rather than practices, um, and they never look at religious objects or sounds or, or art necessarily. So the concept of a post-secular society 
might enable us to understand the more general relevance of religion as a public cultural resource. And it's into this realm of practice, or praxis, as the theologians call it, that culture and arts fit so well. Um, Because between the theist point of view of transcendence as experience that leads one to God, to the divine, and the rationalist approach, which explains as a a heightened level of feeling where there is a kind of pre-Christian Platonism, where justice and goodness and beauty exist, as perfect paradigms and universals in some other world. And when we try to speak of these things and try to apply them to our daily lives, we experience an imperfect version or shadow of that ultimate reality. Martin Luther had this idea of musica uh, celesta and musica mundana, so the, the music of the world somehow being a weak uh, representation of the music of eternity or the music of the spheres. And just to mention um, Iris Murdoch, who takes this further. The appreciation of beauty in art or nature is not only the easiest available spiritual exercise, it is also a completely adequate entry into the good life since it is the checking of selfishness in the interests of seeing the real. So I want to uh, conclude, if I can find my conclusion page, that if we are to venture an explanation for the enduring appeal of sacred music within secular spaces and secular society, then I suggest it's because it speaks deeply to the most fundamental aspects of human flourishing, because it's about encounter, experience, and relationship. And for this reason, sacred music continues to appeal to secular and post-secular audiences, because, as George Steiner put it, music means. It is brimful of meanings which will not translate into logical structures or verbal expression. Moreover, music has long been and continues to be the unwritten theology for those who lack or reject any formal creed. And the reason that so many atheists are hanging on the coattails of religion is that art and music and literature provide their closest access to the religious experience. The search for truth and beauty is one that can be undertaken by the believer, the agnostic, and the atheist alike. For people of faith, they might discern traces of an unknown reality that transcends the world, while for others, the experience of transcendence through music need not point towards a supernatural reality, but is firmly of this world. Either way, and whatever the faith stance, Through sacred music, we often encounter a transformative, relational experience. And in relationship, we find a spark of divinity or spirit. And in art, we might take that experience one stage further and intuit a deep knowledge of the spiritual life that cannot be found by reasoned argument or deductive thinking. It is in this context that community becomes so important. It is through experience, encounter, and relationship that knowledge of a deeper reality of self and other emerges, perhaps through music and the arts, perhaps through nature and the world around us, perhaps through relationships and the people around us. The arts and music in particular offer one important way of finding a transcendent path which can take our experience of the world and help us to perceive the reality and mystical truth of something greater beyond ourselves. And I just want to end with some words of a poem by Carol Ann Duffy called Prayer, which speaks of music in everyday sound that even though 
she's not a believer, feels like prayer. Some days, although we cannot pray, a prayer utters itself. So a woman will lift her head from the sieve of her hands and stare at the minims sung by a tree, a sudden gift. Some nights, although we are faithless, the truth enters our hearts, that small familiar pain. Then a man will stand stock still, hearing his youth in the distant Latin chanting of a train. Pray for us now, grade one piano scales, console the lodger looking out across a Midlands town. Then dusk, and someone calls a child's name as though they named their loss. Darkness outside. Inside the radio's prayer, Rockall, Malin, Dogger, Finister. Thank you. As people know, I particularly love poetry. Um, um, now, Doreen is going to go around with the. Um, where is Doreen? It's going to go around with the microphone. If people would like to um, comment or question or debate with Jonathan or even sing to him. <laughs> uh, who would like to start with the first question or comment? Richard. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That was very thought-provoking. Um, when, when you talked about the contrast at the beginning between decline in most church attendances but the increase in attendance at uh, choral worship, you put the appeal of choral worship primarily in emotional terms, the need for stillness, tranquility, community also, and I guess that would fit into the sort of spiritual but not religious dimension, but I think you also um, referred to views that this, this reflected um, the persistence of a need for metaphysics and theology, and there seemed to be, seemed to be a bit of a, a tension there, and I wonder what your thoughts about that tension are. Um, I mean, at the, again, at the end, on the one hand, you talked about the continuing appeal of sacred music as um, related to human flourishing um, in a sense which could be quite general and separable from any creedal commitment. Um, but there was also, I, I thought I detected a sense that this is a kind of asset religious religiosity, it's not quite the real thing, it's a sort of pale reflection. Is it, is it fair to say that there's a tension there, and if so, what, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a, there's a tension now within, um, within Anglicanism about this. Um, what I would want to say about Choral even song is that you can it's it's many leveled and and many faceted, so you could take it on the creedal level, as as deeply as you want to go, uh, and the words are there for you the the gospel the the, the reading the, the the creed and so on. But if you don't want to, it's quite easy to ignore, and it's usually being performed in a beautiful building with a with a quite a decent choir. So, um, on the one hand, you, you've got even songs which uh, feel like concerts, and um, you've got concerts that feel like even songs now. And the reason I wrote this book in the first place was because I, I stopped singing with the 16, um, and I became a, a chaplain in Oxford. And I was trying to wrestle with what had been going on 
when I traveled around the country singing these choral pilgrimage concerts, which are, um, well, as it says, they're choral music and it's called a pilgrimage, which is a religious word. <laughs> and yet, so they're, they're performing sacred music in a sacred building, but we're buying tickets to hear music that we could hear for free at Choral Eden Song. So what are we doing? What are we paying for? Um, the quality of the choir, uh, but also is it the opportunity to buy religion without having to buy into it? Um, and have we been doing that for a long time anyway? <laughs> um, uh, this is Brian Mountford now in Oxford who is um, who wrote the book Christian Atheist uh, and he went around talking to his friends who love Anglicanism culturally um, but don't believe a word of Christianity and that and really I think I, I suppose what he thought he was doing was going around letting the cat out of the bag so there's there's that side of it and um, I don't know where I would for you know I mean just to put the other side of it, when I, when I stand on stage singing with a professional choir, um, singing a piece of sacred music, for me it is still an expression of faith. Whereas for my colleague next to me it isn't. And we just have to live with that. And I think in Choral Evensong we also have to live with the same kind of tension. And then in Anglicanism and, and in other church denominations, of course, we have a much more completely different kind of music going on, uh, which is much more pop music and, and, and worship band and, and all that kind of thing, which I also enjoy. And, and I've written a, a whole load of stuff about that. And it's, it's being written about more and more on a scholarly basis. Um, and a lot of uh, popular music has been enculturated. You know, if I talk about classical music in a South Korean tube station, you now get Western um, secular pop music in churches. I mean, they literally take the music from the from the street and put it into into the worship song, which ironically is exactly what they used to do in the Middle Ages when they did the parody masses. They take a street song, and bring it in. They take the the tune and make it into the cantus firmus, and then build the whole sacred mass around it. So there's nothing new in that. But if you go back to Martin Luther King in the 1960s, he would have said, gospel music in the church is sacred, and the same kind of sound that you would hear in a, 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 a rock band or a gospel band, a secular one on stage, would be absolutely profane. And he was really clear that there were these two things going on. This is good, and that is absolutely to be condemned and, and, and damned. So the, the, the difference between, um, I don't know, uh, an Aretha Franklin song or something, um, and the worship band, the, you know, the gospel band in church. Um, but that's all changed now. Um, but going back to Coral Leaven song, it's just something that's endured for so long um, it's a phenomenon in itself, which, which is why I give it attention. And I guess there's always been a, um, there, there is always going to be a tension there because it's, um, it appeals to people on so many different levels. Um, and we can be cynical about that or we can be, we can rejoice in it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are two points I'd like to make. Uh, first of all, um, many people here will have heard of the um, fantastic pianist Stephen Huff, mm. who not long ago wrote a piece which I photocopied off the internet, um, explaining what he felt the value of Coral Even Song was. Oh, yeah. That in fact one did not have to take part in any way, mm. one did not have to feel any particular emotion upon mm. entering. Mm. One felt no pressure, mm. but one felt the beauty mm. and the healing mm. touch just of the music itself. Mm. And the other point I would like to make, it's a bit of a cliche, um, God moves in a mysterious way. Mm. 
Um, we have a daughter who is head of music in a prep school in Lincolnshire. Mm. She works very closely with the vicar mm. of the local benefice or parish, mm. who is an SSC, meaning mm. he's quite high mm. and bells and smells. Mm. She is the head of music in the school, and they work together on the services. Mm. Since he has been the vicar, and the previous one was building up to this, mm. The children's choir at the school has gone from 20 to over 50. Mm. And the appeal of the choir mm. is the feeling that it produces within the children who are singing. Mm. And also, from the parents' point of view, what happens to the parents and mm. Mm. The camp followers who mm. attend mm. the quite regular services. Mm. And very recently, um, my daughter phoned me up out of the blue and said, um, it is Trinity, you know, which we know because we both sing in choral even song regularly at Y. Yeah. So we're oh, well, yeah, uh, well aware of that. Yeah, but um, she said, um, Father Ed, who is the vicar, um, is really concerned that the last few times he's tried to produce a very low-key doctrinal yeah. element he's horrified at how little the children actually do know, as you have already mentioned. Yes. They haven't yeah. a clue. What yeah. can we do? Yeah. Well, she always arranges the music yeah. for the services yeah. and is aware of what he wants to do. Mm. And she phoned me up and said, where is this particular thing that I know that we've done? Did you write mm. it? Mm. And I had to say, no, I didn't actually write that one. Um, but we found it. It's in the book that you've got in front of you on number four. And it's to a tune, Halad, which is a sort of um, ethnic tune. And it's a very simple statement of the Trinitarian doctrine, but mm. in a way which a child mm. can not only easily access, mm. but because the tune is simple, and our daughter is actually quite talented anyway, mm. um, the effect, I'm sure, of that being sung mm is going to do something mm. to everyone who either sings it or hears it. And I want people to feel encouraged that it's not just us oldies. It's if you get them, as the Catholics so rightly say, if you get them young, if they get some idea of something, it doesn't matter if they don't completely understand it. Mm. Mm. Singing is prayer. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for an in inspirational talk this evening. Um, I wanted just to um, think a little bit about the Magnificat uh, and the wonderful in, um, settings we hear of it, Margareta and I, when we go to Evensong in, in the cathedral. The music is um, so uplifting, and there's so many different wonderful settings of the Magnificat. But every time I need to remind myself of the, the words of the Magnificat, which are, of course, a pol radical political manifesto, which puts uh, any political order uh, <clears throat> under the microscope, really. And I suppose my question is to you, do you feel that it's possible that the sheer beauty of the music and the excellence of the singing can eclipse the underlying message, which is so important for us mm. to hear in, our, a, in this age, mm. when the mighty really do need pulling down from their mm. thrones mm. and the poor lifting up? Mm. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mary's prayer is, is, is radical, political. Uh, uh, statement and it's interesting how many settings of the Magnificat don't really do justice to those words I don't know why and it brings it, it, it kind of raises the point that we assume sacred music or music in general is there to give us feelings that are nice that um, music is there for, to be consoling, to be, you know, to be, and all of that. But 
Um, that's why Foray's Requiem is so much more popular than Britain's War Requiem. You don't often get people requesting the War Requiem at their funerals. But you, you get Foray all the time. And why? Because it's consoling. Uh, and, and because it, 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 it makes you feel good. So, I can't answer the, 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 the reason why people haven't been more radical. But I would say sacred music doesn't always have to make, it doesn't always have to be nice music, and it doesn't always have to, it should be able to challenge us and, and make us feel uncomfortable and, and, and to leave the room uncomfortable at the end of the day as well as comfortable. And music has the power to do that, so why don't we do it more often? Um, and of course, Benjamin Britten did do that in the War Requiem. But, and the poetry was really key to that, of course, you know, the Sassoon and the, so on, um, making you realize ugh, you know, there is no glory in war. I mean, this is absolutely hor horrific. Uh, yeah. And so, I, yeah, I agree with you, really. <laughs> yeah. there's, one, there's one there, one there, one there, one there. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering if you think there's a future for hymns, mm. because hymns are what people really enjoy being together singing, mm. and they will often sing the most peculiar lyrics mm. if they like the tune. Yep. Um, so do you think that given your disconnect between church going and, and sacred music, are hymns going to be a victim of this? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I did... Um I did my nephew's wedding recently um, up in, uh, in Leicestershire, and, and the whole of my family now go to um, evangelical free churches. So they go to um, New Wine and, um, yeah, uh, uh, and sort of Holy Trinity Brompton um, plants and things like that. So they didn't have hymns, they had worship songs. And it was really interesting because all the oldies didn't know any of these uh, <laughs> songs, and we had guitar and drums and, and, and all of that with a guy, you know, standing up there at the microphone. So it was brilliant. I mean, absolutely loved it. Uh, and I, I guess, you know, that is the new, that's the new way for a lot of people, and, and there's a lot in it because it's really nice. It's really good. And of course, all we have to do is learn it. Um, so... Um, I think there's a future for the hymn, yeah, uh, because it, it, it's been around for a long, long time, you know, I mean, it's from the Bible, you know, in the upper room, <laughs> they sing a hymn. Um, Paul tells you to sing hymns and songs and spiritual uh, things in your heart. Um, so I, I don't see it going away, but, it, but we, again, in the post-secular world, we sort of add other things. And because we're cross-cultural now, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't get more cultural influences into our music. Um, maybe this is more evident in Catholicism, uh, which is perhaps you know, more um, cosmopolitan in, in, in its makeup. Um, but yeah, I think we add in now um, Hillsong and, and all the wonderful new music that, that comes in. Um, and so the 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 uh, the menu to choose from is 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 a is a bigger menu than it used to be. And just as a, an adjunct to that, some of the old hymns from the Victorian period, I would happily um, <laughs> not not sing anymore. And. Um, for for feel you know for the words and and the music, um, we're, they're, they're, a good hymn is not necessarily an old hymn. Let's just say that. Rosemary's picked up on a point that I was going to make anyway, so I hope this follows. Um, I, I speak as a Methodist. Um, you've spoken about Anglican even song and, and, and so. Very much as a performance, mm. 
um, and that people can take it or leave it and, mm. and come as, as a performance. Yeah. And I was thinking about hymn singing, mm. and um, as, as a Methodist, you know, mm. hymn singing is, is fundamental. In fact, in, in many churches in our circuit, people were so sad that during the pandemic, you know, hymn singing was stopped and, and looking and saying, when can we start singing hymns again? Mm. Um, and, and it did strike me that the mic what I was going to ask you, what is the sort of social link as well? Because um, if you're going to a performance, to a certain extent, that is a separation between uh, one group of people and the masses, if mm. you like. Mm. And hymn singing and community singing, mm. and then my mind began to think about I don't know anything about football, but they do sing mm. community yeah. songs there, and people mm. get this feeling you, you were saying about yeah. community choirs mm. and mm. Um, th this feeling of belonging. Mm. Um, and that, now you've just talked in answer to Rosemary's question mm. about worship songs, mm. and I'm, I'm thinking of experiences I've had with um, worship of. of um, people from West Africa or mm. other areas, mm. and, and um, I, I just wondered what your comments would be on that. If, if you wanted to add any more, um, yes, so I'm, I'm thinking about the sort of the social, the political, yeah. um, uh, and hymns coming out to the community rather yeah. than being done at a distance. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you go to any sporting event, you probably hear a hymn at some, at some point. Um, whether it's Abide With Me or, or you know, um, Jerusalem as the England cricket players come out to bat, you know. And of course, um, the hymn in Coral Evensong is the, only, is the only bit, apart from the creed, that you're allowed to join in with. So it was very moving in Canterbury Cathedral when lockdown was coming to an end and the cathedral choir came back. But the only thing that they were allowed to sing during communion was a hymn. And it was much more moving than if they'd done a performance of a piece of Mozart or something. For some reason, it was really powerful. Um, the thing about participation, um, there's long been a debate about active participation and passive participation. So, um, back at the Council of Trent in the middle of the 16th century, um, the Catholic Church, uh, one of the edicts there, is about active participation, which means that you don't have to be singing or saying anything to be active, actively participating in the liturgy. So because you're not vocalizing doesn't mean that you're not participating. So that's the first thing to say. But the second thing to say is that um, experience and encounter and relationship are hugely important in how we perceive music. Music never, and, and, and how we perceive what music means, if it means anything, if it's going to point towards the divine or anything. Um, so if we're listening on our own on headphones, we can get a resonance of that through memory, associations, and so on. But if we're sitting next to somebody and we're hearing it together, then it becomes a completely different experience. Because hearing music and performing music are never uh, done in a vacuum. They're always culturally situated. You know, what does it feel like to be here? What does it feel like for that person to join? What does it feel like now to be listening to this music with 20 people? What does it feel like to be singing this hymn with 100,000 people in a stadium? They're all different experiences, and they're all socially and culturally um, uh, influenced, and not just by the, the there and then, but by the generations, the resonances of generations of that. When a, when a Liverpool fan sings, whatever it is, abide with me, you'll never walk alone, it doesn't just, it's not just a piece of music, you know, and, and so on and so on. So hymns, hymns are cru crucially important in that respect. Um, and I was recently covering um, some of the vacancy down at St. Mary's and um, St. Leonard's in Hythe, 
which goes with the Methodist church. So I would do the 9.30 at the Anglican and then the 11 at the Methodist. And um, of course the Methodist hymn book is slightly different to the, to the Anglican one, so you have different hymns. So there must be something about, um, yeah, there's something um, about, the, about the tradition and the resonance and the history of a particular denomination that is personal and, you know, and we remember our parents and our grandparents and, you know, the generations of Methodists or Anglicans or Baptists who, who've gone before us. Um, so you, it's, the cultural associations go and the religious associations go on and on and on like ripples in a pool, you know. Stacy has a, had a hand up for a while, I think. Thank you, Jonathan. Your comment about the hymns from Rosemary. The curate at St. Mary Bread and Ray worshipped sometimes. Had been converted, was doing his first degree, they did ordination training, was very much in the um, Holy Trinity mode, prompted, and they came to us as a curate, and he said he was amazed at singing hymns, how much theology was in these hymns yeah. compared to the worship songs. Yeah. If you want to know what people's theology is, ask them what their favourite hymn is. <laughs> yeah, simple as that. Thank you. I think I'm going to take us back to the first two questions and pick up on some of the thinking there. Um, so thank you. That was a wonderful talk and so many resonances when you were talking about music and fantastic that we got to take part as well. Um, one of the thoughts that I was um, beginning and wonder what you think is it felt like there was um, a separation between um, music in its way of communicating and more philosophical or doctrinal ways of thinking. And I wonder if this could be perhaps approached in a different way. So to explain this, I have to tell a story. About three years ago, I arrived at Canterbury West Station and I was astounded to hear two employees having an argument about the Trinity. I know, and I actually pretended I was doing something because I just wanted to listen. And they were really, really having a very good argument. And it made me think, gosh, this is so unusual, but if we've perhaps gone back to the fourth century, this is be what everyone would be doing down the pub or on the street corner. Um, but it made me think, well, what are we doing if we're not arguing about the Trinity? And this perhaps links to your day job. Mm. What we are thinking about are things to do with ecology and mm. the climate crisis, mm. things to do with injustice in society. Mm. And I wonder if there's perhaps a parallel mm. um, that you can have these cultural aspects that involve thought mm. and social engagement and connection and belonging, mm. um, but perhaps they've changed slightly mm. in how they're um, operating. So perhaps a bit like classical music mm. versus popular music. Mm. Oh, can we perhaps make a parallel with the spoken word and more rational thought? Mm, yeah. So, there's a big um, debate going on right now between uh, some heavyweight thinkers in the world of music and theology. One is called Jeremy Begbie, some of you may have heard of. Um, he started life in Cambridge and um, went off eventually to St. Andrews to form the, I can't remember what it's called now, the Centre for Theological, Theology and the Arts or something. It's a very, very good institute up there at St. Andrews. And his colleagues, uh, David Brown and Gavin Hopps up there as well, and other people like Trevor Hart and, and so on. So Begbie um, is a fine musician and has written many, many excellent books on music and theology, but his basic stance is one that music in itself means nothing, um, and it's only Trinitarian doctrinal um, uh, certainties, or um, doctrines, let's say, that um, actually give us any meaning to it. And if music does have a meaning, like a triad, a C and an E and a G, a nice chord, which resonates nicely, it points towards the Trinity. It's not something in itself. Pythagoras was the one who came up with the, the idea, you know, you could take a piece of string and you turn it in half and you get an octave higher. And these ratios suddenly became beautifully mathematical. 
from which he posited that God the Creator must have some kind of musical basis to the essence of the cosmos. So the world is musical, inherently musical, music of the spheres, that's where, it, that's where we got it from. Because as, you know, God created everything so that it, it resonated with, with him. It was Augustine who said, God is music. That might sound really radical, but what he was trying to say was God the creator is, is this kind of, um, this, uh, this person who puts beauty at the center um, of creation. Um, so the debate goes on now with Begbie saying you can't, you can't, music doesn't tell us anything at all. It, it's a metaphor and it points towards the word which then gives us the divine revelation. And the divine revelation is to be found in scripture and that's it. Okay, so then you get Brown and Hobbes. Hobbes is a specialist in pop music. David Brown has been a long-term adversary, and they wrote this book a couple of years ago called The Extravagance of Music, in which they say, through music itself, any kind of music, you can get an essence of the ineffable, the, 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 the unknowable. You can't know God the same way that you know anything else, as Richard Raw has said. So you can't know God just through the intellectual, the dialectical, the, the rational. You have to go into the world of, as Ian Mobsby calls it, the trans-rational. That liminal space between the rational and the, the sort of totally ineffable. Um, and then they start arguing about apophatic theology, about the unknowable God and what is apophatic and, and so on. And the row goes on. I'm uh, just writing about it now for Robin Gill and his theology journal. So um, I don't know what to say about it, Stacey, ex except that we, we probably are arguing about it. I mean, the, the Begbie Brown debate is, is kind of the public version of the, the row at the train station. And, and, and it just goes on and on and on. Um, that uh, what is the Trinity, what is God, how do we know God, uh, at what point do we connect with God, um, which part of the Trinity connects with, with us, and so on, you know. Um, yeah, I probably haven't answered your question very well, but, uh, but thank you for the question. <laughs> Right, we'll, we'll be quick. You go, Joe, you've got the microphone. Yep. Right, um, a quick, I hope, historically useful point about the early Jesuits, who had a very interesting split. Mm. They did not sing office in choir at all. They did not even, when it came to masses, sing them. In, for example, the Jesuit church in Vienna, they had a choir and they had priests from the diocese to do the sun. Mm. service. But when it came to their schools, they were extremely keen on drama and music. This mm. was something, for example, Edmund Campion wrote plays mm. when he was at before. Mm. Mm. Uh, so you had this huge input into the dramatic and the music. Yeah. Yeah. And, the other inter and when it came to the Americas, the missions in the Americas, mm. they rapidly discovered that people, they wanted, they took flutes, violins, mm. and mm. they use those to, first of all, initially engage the, the yep. Indians they were trying to... Like the film The Mission. Yes, like The Mission. <laughs> That's, of course, a good deal later in this story, actually. But yes, The yeah. Mission chose it, but that was yeah. right from the start. Yeah. And that was what they did, really. There's a yeah. slight historical footnote, which is in, I think, 2005, they launched, the British Jesuits launched an online service called Pray As You Go, right. which was a podcast which you could download, it's still going. They did a trial one then, it proved so popular the provincial had no choice but to keep it going. <laughs> and, but that, interestingly, had a mixture of music, prayer, reflections. So mm. that contrasts, of course, with their own experience. Yeah. I just thought it may fit, you know, this is just historic examples Very good. of music. Yep. 
and where it's allowed in and where it isn't. Yep. We could talk about where, when it's been banned as well in, uh, in history. <coughs> I try and be quick. Um, I'm spinning on in my head. I have a background in music through movement. Mm. And it always fascinates me how even this discussion at the moment is very much talking about anything which goes mm. on up in our heads mm. and in our maybe heart, mm. but anything else mm. in the body is really ignored and mm. we, we, we process very well and we, mm. sit, we stand up and sit down and mm. we stand up and sit down. Mm. But most other cultures, other ways of making yeah. music include their bodies, don't Absolutely. they? And their experience of, of anything spiritual is also a physical mm. experience. Mm. Have you got anything to say about that? Yes, there's there's a there's a there's a whole um, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, and I've written about this as well. Uh, there's um, uh, a, a scholar called Maguire has written about embodied spirituality, particularly um, in singing. Uh, she's talking about, but um, I've also done some work with um, Robin Dunbar, who's an evolutionary psychologist from Oxford who talks about the origins of music and, and its purposes in, in social cohesion and so on. And you're absolutely right, music and dance very often go hand in hand um, with uh, religious experience. Aborigines dancing and then going into a trance and, and so on, and uh, connections with ancestors and so on, all sorts of things. Now, he would explain this, uh, the experience of that in terms of endorphin release you know, and ke you know, brain chemicals, um, dopamine, and, and so on, which is true. Um, and, um, and also, interestingly, you can get an endorphin release even from a long sermon. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you're seated there long enough, your brain will inject something in. And after about 15, 20 minutes, when it's, when it's really just about, you know, getting there, um, that you get an injection of endorphins and a, a, nice, a nice feeling of dopamine going in. So just in case you think that's a brilliant part of the sermon, you're actually being drugged at that point. So just, just beware. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the, the, the two fundamental human expressions are voice and physical movement, absolutely. And, and they go absolutely hand in hand right the way down the, down the ages. No, we don't talk about it and we don't do it, actually. And we don't do it in, um, certainly don't do it in liturgy very much, apart from processing and standing up, sitting down, all, the, all of that kind of thing. But we don't do it with any imagination, no. Um, Stacey is going to give a vote of thanks. So Jonathan, thank you for coming this evening. It's been a wonderful, entertaining evening, um, as well as extremely stimulating. I've got to say that I've personally found so many resonances in things that you've spoken about. And I often say to people, my own journey to Christianity um, was actually through the fresh expression of Cora Levin song. Yes. So it was one of these people that you've perhaps been researching and writing yes. about. Yeah. Um, but I, I think as well as the poetry in the way in which you spoke about Even song, um, it's been wonderful to hear about some of your own work and others' work in trying to think about music and the way in which it can engage people directly in their journey and drawing into spirituality and also its role in social cohesion, relationship, and I think really importantly in healing things that we all need in our um, secular or perhaps even post-secular society. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be saying goodbye to you all for six months because our series would come to an end. But because we'd been starved for two years um, and um, because we're coming up to um, rather a large conference that's going to be taking place at the top of the hill um, later in 
July and August, um, which I think might be called the Lambeth Conference, um, we decided we'd have one more lecture in July, and that is going to be on Wednesday, the 20th of July, so just before the conference starts. Um, and we thought we'd go somewhat sideways to the topic about Lambeth. Um, we are having Jonathan Hustler, who is the Methodist Conference Secretary, so you can't get much higher than that, um, and formerly Vice Principal of Wesley House, Cambridge. And he's going to be talking about what hope now of Anglican Methodist unity. So I think with our audience and with our venue, that someone's laughing already, um, I think that would be a very fitting end to our season. So do hope to welcome a lot of you to, to that. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Jonathan.